Well, shall we pray as we begin? Uh, gracious Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is a life-giving word. And we pray this morning uh, that we would hear it aright, uh, to the praise of your name and the glory of Christ. And we are sat in his most precious name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Add my welcome to Karen's. Uh, if you're new or visiting us for the first time, or if you stumbled across us, uh, this recording on our website, it's great to have you with us. You're very welcome. If you'd like to find out more about Trinity, what we get up to during the week, I would like to ask any questions uh, about what's said this morning, then uh, please do get in touch. Uh, it's easily done through our website. You join us this morning as we continue to look at the Lord's Prayer. We're going to spend a few weeks doing that over the next few Sundays. Why? Well, simply because of the times we're in. For many, they're anxious times, fearful times. Scripture encourages us when anxious or fearful to pray. When we're reminded of that and try and do it, though, we soon realise that we don't really know how to. We need help. And that's fine. The first disciples had the same problems and asked Jesus to help them. Lord, teach us to pray, they said. And he did. His words are recorded for us in Luke 11 and Matthew 6, and we're going to look briefly at Matthew 6 this morning. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, will you turn with it to me, Matthew 6, or, or follow the link that's about to be posted in the chat if you haven't got a Bible in front of you. Last week, we looked at the first few words, our Father in heaven. Today, I want to look briefly at the next phrase, hallowed be your name. What on earth does that mean? And how can knowing what it means help us to pray? So firstly, what does it mean? Well, what do you think of when you hear the word hallowed? Are you thinking perhaps the final Harry Potter book, The Deathly Hallows? Not sure that's going to help us very much. Or are you thinking of hallowed ground, you know, like Wembley Stadium or Lords or Centre Court at Wimbledon? It's getting a bit nearer, I think. Does anyone remember what Djokovic has done every time he's won Wimbledon? Why don't you message me in the chat if, if you do know? You'll have to be quick, though. If you can remember what he did after each and every victory. Uh, he's won the title three times, and after each one, he's done something. Something that he's never done before after any other tournament. Any suggestions? No, he didn't kiss the ground. After winning the final point, he celebrated by crouching down, picking some grass, and eating it. He described it as the sweetest dessert ever. A bit bizarre, really. Why did he do it, though? Why at Wimbledon and nowhere else? Well, because Wimbledon is different, special, set apart. It stands alone among all the other tennis tournaments across the world. There is simply no other like it. It's separate, unique. And the centre court, well, that's the place of special honour and respect. It is hallowed ground. When we pray to God, our Father, hallowed be your name, we are both acknowledging that God is special, set apart, separate, unique, and asking him that he be acknowledged everywhere as just that, special, separate, separate, set apart, unique. We want him to be held in the highest regard, honoured and respected as one apart, holy. May your name be honoured is how some modern versions translate hallowed be your name, and that's getting there, I think, hallowed, honoured. The Old Testament describes several uh, God in several ways and uses the word holy more than any other. Holy means distinct, set apart, utterly different. In praying these words, we're asking God that he would ensure that his name receives the honour and respect it's due. That he is seen and acknowledged and worshipped and served by everyone as the God that he has revealed himself to be. May your name be honoured, hallowed be your name. In Revelation 4, that was read to us a moment ago, we get a sneak peek of what heaven is like. There's music there, not background music, but foreground music. A song is sung continuously, day and night, and no one gets fed up with it. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord, our God, to receive glory, honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. As one writer puts it, to hallow our Father is to join in these crowds, delighting in the holiness of God in awestruck wonder. 
To pray that his name would be hallowed is to pray that others may join in that song, both now and for eternity. If we pray that and mean it, and why else would we pray it? It will not only affect our prayers, but our whole lives, how we think, how we talk, how we live. Concern for God's honour and reputation will affect everything. And we'll come back to that in a moment as we try and think of some concrete examples. But first, let's just think a bit on what it means for God's name to be honoured and respected. Why is the prayer, may your name be honoured? And not just, may you be honoured? If a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, what is significant about God's name? Why does God's name matter? Well, the answer is simply this. God's name is more than just simply an identifier. It's a revelation. A revelation of his character and his purposes. Clarkson, Corbyn, very different politics, but both Jeremy's. Same name, very different characters. Our names don't reveal much about our characters, our natures, but Bible names are different. They often reveal a lot about the character of the person concerned. And God's name in the Bible is like that. It's supremely a revelation of who he is, his character, his concerns, his purposes for the world. God gives himself a number of names in the Bible, Eloah, Elohim, God with a capital G, if you like, mighty, powerful, supernatural creator. Less well known, perhaps, than Yahweh, from which we get the word Jehovah, a very significant name. The name by which he revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush and at Mount Sinai, Yahweh. Translates as, I am who I am, or I will be whom I will be, I will do what I will do. You shall know me, God tells Moses and the Israelites. You shall know who I am and will be by what I shall do. Okay, but what's that then? What are you going to do that reveals who you are and by which you are to be known? Well, God's words to Moses and the Israelites are recorded in Exodus 3. Let me read them to you. He says, I am the Lord, Yahweh, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from slaves, being slaves to them. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt under the yoke of the Egyptians. God makes himself known, reveals himself as the God who keeps his promises, rescues his people from slavery and brings them to himself to be his treasured possession. He is a mighty, faithful, rescuing God, saving a people for himself. That's extraordinary enough, but there's even more. Do you remember when Moses asked to see God's glory and when he hid in a rock? in the cleft and God revealed his glory. Do you remember how he did it? If you have a Bible, why don't you turn quickly to Exodus chapter 34 verse 5. We'll post a link there in the chat as well. Exodus 34 verse 5. Have you got it? How does God reveal his glory? Can you see? He does it by proclaiming his name. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. The Lord, the Lord, patient, loving, faithful, forgiving, just. A God who rescues his people just as he promised. Do you see how God's name reveals who he is and summarises his character and mission? You may remember in the account of the Gospels where the angel tells Joseph the name he is to give Mary's child. You shall call him Jesus. Why so? Because, Joseph is told, he shall save his people from their sins. That is what the name Jesus means, God saves. He shall save his people from their sins. God the Father chooses to name his son that way. Why? Because it too summarises his character and mission. It brings together all the names of God previously seen in the Old Testament. For Jesus is a complete revelation of God. 
in him is the fullness of God dwelt in bodily form. Jesus, God saves. So Jesus is the mighty God. He's a creator and ruler. He's the patient, loving, faithful, rescuing God, merciful and just. Hold on. How can he be that? Merciful and just. Can't be both, surely. Can't on the one hand forgive wickedness and rebellion, and yet at the same time be just in dealing with the wicked. How can justice and mercy coexist? It's a complete mystery. Until, that is, it is revealed at the cross, where God in Christ's death justly punishes our wickedness and rebellion and at the same time extends mercy to those who don't deserve it which of course is the character of mercy it is extended to those who don't deserve it that's why it's mercy jesus god saves jesus our sacrifice our peace our victory our shepherd our righteousness god with us god saves so when we pray hallowed be your name we're asking God that everyone acknowledges and recognises Jesus, recognises God's power to save in him, for everyone to bow before God's anointed, the risen and exalted King. We know that one day that will happen, because God has said it will happen. And as the song puts it, he keeps every promise and his word is true. What he is, he says, and what he says he'll do. One day, everyone will recognise and acknowledge and worship Jesus as King. Until that time, we pray, hallowed be your name. It's a prayer for the universal recognition of Christ's rule, for the evangelization of the world, for the conversion of the world, that people will hear about Jesus, that people will acknowledge, honor, and respect Jesus, serve and worship him in repentance and the obedience of faith. One day, we'll be part of that great throng in heaven singing God's praises. And we, we can and do express that hope and desire in song as we gather together week by week, even if only at the moment they're virtually online. There's a shadow, a foretaste, an outpost of that heavenly gathering. But hallowing God's name will be seen amongst us in more than just our singing and praying, important though those two things are. It will also be seen in our lives, our hopes, our ambitions, our speaking, our living. The desire and priority of God being honoured and respected as God will be expressed in how we spend our resources, our time, our money, our energies, physical and emotional. How we behave and speak with one another, at home, at work, wherever we find ourselves. Everything will be affected. Because God's purposes and plans, once a complete irrelevance, now constrain us. When we understand that, because of Jesus' work, his death, his resurrection, ascension, when we understand we can call God Father, and that we are invited into the family business, not as an employee, but as sons, and that's not a gendered term here, but a signifier of inheritance rights, men and women can all be sons in this sense. When we come to realise that the family business is the redemption and renovation of the world, an inheritance for us to share with Christ in glory, we cannot but be changed as our hopes and desires, our ambitions and our plans, that once circled around ourselves, are now concerned with God and his plans and his ambitions. What we hope for, what we work for, what we do, how we do it, will all begin to look very different as this revolution in our thinking becomes, works, it begins to work out, and we throw a lot in with the family business. We will be saddened when those invited refuse to join or speak against it, or take the name of our father in vain. We will be upset when others disrespect him or other family members or seek to bring them down. A mark of family membership will be a shared concern for our father's reputation and honor, his person and his work. And we will be praying for it, working for it, and be united with those who share that concern for it. We will partner with them to work towards a common aim. In response to COVID-19, the events at eight o'clock in the UK on Thursday evenings, uh, some have said that they thought this, that this showed that the NHS has become the national religion, the weekly clapathon being the nation expressing its praise. 
One response to COVID-19 in Australia has been rather different. National church leaders have joined together in a call to Australian Christians to come together under the banner of COVID-19 call to prayer. And they're asking all Christians, all those who call can call God Father, to set their alarms to pray for 90 minutes at 1900 hours every day. On their website on the 25th of March, they posted this, hallowed be your name. When we pray, we are asking for God's name to be glorified, not ours. We live in a country where the name of God is likely to be used as a swear word as it is a prayer word. May this crisis result in people truly calling upon the name of the Lord. Perhaps you remember Paul's word in Romans, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, they continue on the website. We praise you, O Lord, that in the midst of darkness and despair, you have given us good news that is for all the world. We bless you that no matter the darkness around and within, the good news does not change and the light shines ever brighter. Help us to share that news. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we pray that we would indeed be those who hallow your name, who are constrained by a concern for your name, your glory, your reputation, your honour, and that not only that we would honour it, but all those around us whom we know would be so inclined. Heavenly Father, we realise that takes a miracle of new birth, and so we pray in your mercy that you might be working amongst us and through us to bring many, many dozens, hundreds, thousands to faith and trust in the Lord Jesus. And we ask that for his name's sake. Amen.